Good morning. I invite you to stand and turn to hymn 68 and join us in singing Holy, Holy, Holy. What a day, what a day that we have before us, and what a joy it is to be a part of this baptismal service. We have the privilege of baptizing four today who have, who have put their trust and have yielded their life to Christ over the past few weeks, and uh, it is a privilege and such a blessing uh, to be a part of this service today. And you pray for each one of them and their families as they are obediently following the Lord today, saying to this group gathered, I am not ashamed of Christ. He is my Lord and my Savior. I put my trust in Him alone to save me. And I want you to know, I want the world to know that I belong to Him. As you would be reminded, those who are with us today, these waters are just a means by which they are demonstrating obedience to Christ and to the Word of God. They are saved. They are as saved as they can possibly be because they have yielded their life to Jesus. They acknowledged they were a sinner and needed Christ as their Savior. But now they are seeking to obey His command that says, Make disciples, but then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they are here today to demonstrate that step of obedience. And I pray that if you're here and you have not yielded your life to Christ, that today would be the day you would trust Him. You may be here and say, Brother Brad, I've been saved, but I've never been scripturally baptized. I've never been immersed. I've never followed the Lord obediently in being baptized. Let their witness encourage you to step forward today and say, I'm ready. I'm ready to be a part of that group of the unashamed. Follow Him and obey Him, and He'll honor you and bless you for that. So we are here to rejoice in the grace of God and in the obedience of these followers of Christ. Let's pray. Father, bless now as we have the joy of baptizing these four. We thank you for their recent decision of yielding their life to Jesus alone as their Lord and Savior. Bless now their baptismal service. Speak to our heart, Lord, through this wonderful message that represents and pictures your death, your burial, and your resurrection. Lord, speak to our hearts through this. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. are you trusting Jesus amen amen you have put your faith in Christ and today you're here to follow him in believers baptism amen 
in obedience to the commands of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your public profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my sister, Mason Hedger, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you, hon. Amen. Amen. Jacob, who are you trusting in as your Lord and Savior? Amen. Jacob, we rejoice in your recent decision to follow Christ and uh, praise the Lord for your act of obedience today by following him in believer's baptism. In obedience to the commands of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and upon your public profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my brother Jacob Harris, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in the likeness of his death. Raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Let's pray that God would entrust to us many, many more who will come to know Christ and that we will be faithful to honor him by discipling them, helping them to grow in their faith. But let us be faithful in sharing the good news. And in that, God may give us the opportunity to see some more come to know Christ in a personal way. Let's continue to worship our Lord this morning. Amen.
God's word this morning. Our scripture reading is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that has been set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I'll tell you, I, th- I am thankful for Jesus, for a Savior who is not only the initiator, the, the founder of our faith, but also the perfecter. He's our sustainer. He, he is the perfecter of our faith. And we can look to him uh, to be our Savior, uh, to be our example, uh, to be our helper, to be our guide uh, through this life. I tell you, I'm, I'm thankful for that. Uh, may God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated.
time that children can be dismissed for Children's Church. As the children are making their way out, I need to just say a word to you, the church family, uh, on behalf of our family. Thank you so much for your expression of kindness to our family over the past several days. Uh, so many of you have stepped in and pitched in and helped us uh, with the wedding that we uh, enjoyed last night. Some of you made pies, some of you ironed tabletops, some of you were here helping decorate, cleaning up last night late. We, couldn't have, we could not have done it without you. And I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you and uh, love you. And thank you for blessing our family, especially blessing our daughter uh, on her special day. So thank each one of you. Uh, and then thank you for your prayers. I know there have been many prayers uh, lifted up on our behalf. And uh, we just so are so grateful to you uh, for the kindness that you've showed us. So the Lord bless you. And uh, you dads who, before this time, had given away those sweet daughters, now I understand. <laughs> I tried to sympathize with you guys, but I, now I can empathize. And you fellas, oh, Brian, <laughs> I can empathize a little better. I'll be there to help a little more. Uh, you daddies, as you give away your, your girls uh, in the future. So... So, uh, so thank you so much. I appreciate you so much. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn to the Old Testament, the Old Testament book of Numbers. One old preacher said, he was listening to folks, said God's not concerned about numbers. He's not concerned about nickels. He's not concerned about noses. But it's amazing that in God's Word, he wrote a book entitled Numbers. So maybe God is a little concerned about nickels and noses. And I think he's concerned about noses because every nose represents a soul. And I know God wants every soul to know Christ as, as their Lord and Savior. And we're praying that the Lord will continue to uh, let us experience a time of harvest, that more will come to know Christ uh, during this season in which some of our young people and children have responded to the gospel. If you're here today and you have yet to yield your life to Jesus, there's no reason to wait another day. There's no reason to put it off. There's no reason to miss out on the blessings of God's wonderful grace and to know that you belong to Him and to know you're saved and, and you're a child of God. And we pray you will come to know the Lord. But in Numbers chapter 21, Numbers chapter 21, we see, we see something that in, in many ways it, it feels like it's taken out of some sci-tech, high-tech, science fiction type of movie. I don't know how we would compare what the children of Israel were experiencing during this period of time. Something unusual. This week as I was reading up about this particular creature that is mentioned in this passage of Scripture, there was all types of explanations for, for what it was, what it looked like, pictures that had been uh, drawn through the years to try to describe this, this unruly, deadly, dangerous creature that was wrecking havoc on the people of God. It's recorded here in Numbers chapter 21. I mean, it's almost like something out of some uh, zombie apocalypse or walking dead or some kind of weird creatures from space coming in and attacking human beings. But look with me. Look at what happens here. It says in verse 4, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea. Now, this place, Horma, as it's described in verse 3, it's, the description here is a place of destruction. It was, a, it was an awful place. It was a difficult place to be. And, and it says, As they journeyed from this place by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom... And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. They became impatient in their, in their traveling, in their wandering. And then notice what it says in verse 5. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. 
You ever notice how we do that as human beings? When we get discouraged, when we are impatient, when we get a little bit of uh, anger setting in, what do we do? Well, we start criticizing. We start talking about others, folks that have let us down. Well, the people of God, they were attacking God. God, where are you? God, why are you allowing this to happen? Why is life so difficult? And since God is not one that we can uh, kind of have a face-to-face -face confrontation with and someone we can get in their face, the next step is to attack the one who represents God, the messenger, and poor Moses, who, as you know, never wanted to lead the children of Israel. He did not want to pastor this particular congregation. But God didn't give him a choice. God said, you're the man. And so he's having to lead these people, and now they're speaking against Moses. And, he, and they say to him, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. They, they were sick of this manna. They detest the manna. And look what happens in verse 6. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now, folks, this fiery serpent, it, it, it's, it's something out of, out of uh, some high-tech movie, some type of science fiction type movie. This serpent that, that has been described by many who have researched this said it probably was a winged type of uh, serpent had wings where it could fly. Other passages of Scripture talks about this, it being a flying, fiery serpent. It undoubtedly had a very poisonous and painful sting, whether in its tail or mouth, most likely its tail. And when it would sting a person, it would infiltrate their body with poison that would leave them in such pain, and it was so deadly that, that many were dying. I mean, can you imagine... Uh, the, these flying type birds or serpents flying around and you're trying to avoid them and you're being hit by them and they're, they're, they're injecting you with their poison. You can imagine the horror that the people were feeling about this. It was all due to the fact of their response to God's ways, God's direction in their life. And God had to send a fiery serpent in retribution. Now I want you to see several things here in this passage of Scripture. We know that this passage of Scripture is written for our benefit. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we find that the Scripture tells us in the New Testament concerning the story here in the Old Testament that this was written for our example. It was written for our benefit. We as a church can benefit. And if you're here today and you are not a part of the family of God, this has been written for you. It has been written for your help. It has been written for your benefit. And so what is it that the Lord is wanting us to glean from this that we can make application to our own life? Well, the first thing that we notice about the people and about the situation that was going on here is that their nature was being revealed and their nature was proving to be a rebellious nature toward God. There was rebellion in their heart. They were rebellious toward God, and they were rebellious toward the man of God. And what did they do? They spoke against God. They spoke against Moses. Now, we would call this murmuring. Murmuring. Do we ever murmur? <laughs> do we ever murmur against God about our place? 
about our state, about our condition, about our uh, way of life and, and what we're going through? Well, they did, and we do too. And then we have a tendency to murmur about other people. We murmur about uh, leaders in the community. We murmur about uh, uh, ministers in the churches. We murmur about teachers in the school. We murmur about the boss at work. We murmur about our spouse at home. We just murmur, murmur, murmur. <laughs> and that's what they were doing. And their murmuring revealed a rebellious nature. The reason they were murmuring because they had doubted God. They were doubting what God said He would do. God said He would deliver them, but they were not trusting the Lord. They were doubting God. They were in a difficult strait. They had been in a very difficult place, and they were distrusting. They were not trusting the Lord that He would fulfill His promise that He would deliver them. So they began to doubt God. And then they disliked what God was providing. The Bible says that this food they were eating, they loathed it. It was manna. Manna must have been pretty, pretty neat because it's basically what they ate. And it provided all the nutrients. It provided all the vitamins. It provided everything that they needed to keep going and wandering and walking and traveling. And, and it gave them energy and stamina. And, uh, and as one man said, it was like it was angel bread, you know? It was like angel cake. <laughs> it was just this nice little wafer that God would provide on a daily basis. He would give just enough that they needed. It met all their needs. It was sufficient for what they needed. But guess what? They were getting sick of His provision. God, we're tired that you're not fulfilling your promise to me. You're not making life better and easier for us. It's getting harder. And, and now we're sick of what you provide. I imagine their mantra was something like, manna in the morning, manna in the noontime, manna when the sun goes down. And they were sick of manna. Tired of it. Tired of eating manna. There was no contentment. They were unhappy. And then they despise the preacher. Poor Moses. Moses, a man who was not looking for a job. He already had one. He was quite content doing what he was doing. And God says, Moses, go lead my people. Now they're mad at Moses. They're saying, Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die? Moses could have said, listen, it wasn't me. It was God. You think I'm the one that delivered you from Egypt? I, I'm just his messenger boy. I'm just the one with the, uh, the, following the plan that God laid out. I didn't ask for this. And so now they despise the preacher. They're mad. They're disappointed with God. And they just have to take it out on the closest thing they could. You know, we all have a nature. We have an old nature. We have a sin nature. If you're here today and you're not saved, that's all you have. You have one nature. A rebellious, sin nature. If you're saved, you still have that old nature. You have a new nature because of your relationship with Christ. You, you're a new man in Christ, but you still have that old nature. And it can rise up. It can become very deadly and dangerous to you if you're not cautious. And so the people of God are re revealing this rebellious nature that existed in their heart. And they are murmuring. And look at the serious consequences because then in verse 6, we see the sobering retribution that they faced. Look at verse 6. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. God initiated this. God says to these people through the sending of this serpent-like creature that is biting them and stinging them and causing them to become very ill and sick, and, they're, and many are dying from the poison that is flowing through their body, God said there must be a retribution for the sinful rebellion that you're demonstrating. You see, God takes sin very seriously, folks. It's amazing how we characterize and, 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 and basically assign degrees to sin. But listen, God was doing this over the sin of complaining, the sin of murmuring. And so we might ought to be very cautious with how we use this lip and mouth that God has given us. 
You know, the Bible says every man ought to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and then slow to wrath. Because God takes murmuring, God takes complaining, God takes these kind of things very serious to the point that he sent a sobering retribution. He sent serpents. These serpents were fiery in nature. Undoubtedly, the sting, when it hit the body, was like fire burning up your leg, fire burning in your arm, fire burning in your back. I mean, when it would hit and when it would bite and when it would sting, it was like fire had protruded intruded into your body with a painful sting. But it also was a very fatal, a fatal sting. It says that many died. Many of the people of Israel died. It was a very deadly sting that they were experiencing. Well, what is the reaction when things get worse than we thought they were? They were complaining about the food. They were complaining about the travel arrangement. They were complaining about the one who was uh, their guide. And now they're realizing, you know what? We may have made a mistake here. And look who they go to. They go to the very one they've been complaining about. Now, what would you have done if you were Moses? You said, listen, where were you back here? When, uh, when everybody was complaining and fussing and fighting and, and ready to take off my head... And now what they're doing, they're coming to the same one, Moses, verse 7. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Well, they're finally, they're going in the right direction. We've spoken against the Lord. Yes, you have. And we've spoken against you. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. Moses was such a godly man. Moses did not hold this to their account. He did not hold this against them. He had a shepherd's heart. He was a pastor of pastors, and he prayed for them. He could have said, I, I, I don't have time right now to pray for you. Look at what you've done to me. Look at how you, dra you have dragged my name through the mud. Look at all that you've come, done against me, and now you're coming begging me to pray for you, to go to God in heaven, and pray for you, to, to deliver you. But he did, and he prayed, and guess what? God gave a remarkable saving remedy. We know it's of God. Because who in their right mind would do what Moses was told to do? God said to Moses, make a fiery serpent. Make a serpent identical to the one that is causing all the damage. Make a model, make a, 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 a serpent, and then once you have made it, put it on a pole. Stick it on the pole. And then it shall be that everyone who's been bitten, if they'll go and look at it, They'll be healed. And folks, we wouldn't come up with that kind of plan. We'd be searching for medication. We'd be looking for roots for them to be drinking and eating, or we'd be doing something differently. You know, we wouldn't build a model of the very thing that is causing the pain, and then everybody go look at it, and then you'll be healed and you'll be you'll be delivered. God's saving remedy is divine in nature. Only God can provide something of that sort. But another thing we see about it is it, it was a certain remedy. It was certain. It was sure. It would work. It'll work. It was sufficient. God's remedy is always perfect. God gave the remedy. All man had to do was follow the requirements. And look at the requirements in verse 8. It says, It shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looked at it, shall live. Notice that. Number one, it was easy in his requirement. All they had to do was go and just look and live. Look at it, and they would live. Look at it, and they would live. That's all they had to do. Can you imagine if you were a child of a parent that had been bitten, and you heard this, and you're running home, you're full of joy? My daddy can live. My daddy can be saved. My daddy doesn't have to die. Neighbors have died. People are in excruciating pain. I've heard my dad crying out at night crying out, looking for hope, looking for help, and you have heard the news, there's help! And you're running and you're saying, Dad, there's a way, there's help. All you have to do is go and look at this serpent that's hanging on a pole, and you will be healed. You imagine there were probably many daddies, many moms, maybe some children who said, that is the most foolish thing I've ever heard in my life. 
who in their right mind would think that if you go and look at a serpent hanging on a pole that it would provide healing. I need some medicine. Get the doctor here. I need some help now. Don't give me this mythological stuff. Don't give me this fictional stuff. I need something that's true and real that'll work. And they're begging their parents. They're begging their children. They're begging their friends to just go and look. It's this easy. But it was too easy. Look and live. Look and live. I tell you, it was not only easy, it was essential. They had to look and live. God could not make an exception. God could not say, well, listen, for those of you who, d who don't want to go this route, we've got another plan, plan B. And you, you do this. God didn't give a plan B. God didn't give another way. God didn't give another choice. He said, this is the way. It is essential. You must look if you want to live. You must look if you want to live. And you know what? It was for everyone. What I like about this, it was for everyone. It says, it shall be that everyone who is bitten. Everyone. They didn't have to go over here and say, sorry, sir, you're not part of the everyone. Sorry, sir, you're not part of the group that can go and look. He said, everyone who's bitten, everyone who's been bitten because of their sinful nature, because of their rebellious nature, every single one, if they'll just go and look, they will live. Now, folks, as I look at this story, and we know it was true, and we know that it's, it's of God, there's something deeper. There's something greater here that we must see when we look at this passage. Let me read to you over in 1 Corinthians. I alluded to this earlier, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want you to hear with your own ears. If you want to turn there, you can see it with your own eyes. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 9. It says, Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. This is talking about this very situation. It's talking about that. And then look at verse 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. He is saying, Paul is saying, as he writes to the church at Corinth, what happened among the people of God wandering in the wilderness when they rebelled against God and God sent a, 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 a saving remedy, it was written for our, for our benefit. It was written for our example. It was written to help us. So what is it that we can learn from this? Well, number one, we can learn that according to Romans chapter 3, verse 10, the Bible says there, there's none righteous. No, not even one. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us, every single human being has a rebellious problem. We have an old nature. We have a sin nature. We were born with this nature. We didn't gain it somewhere along the road. We were stung by sin because of Adam's choice in the garden, because of their failure to obey God. The Bible says they died. They died. Their nature was rebellious, and we inherited it from them. And we are all guilty. Folks, we are just like the children of Israel murmuring and complaining. And we've been bitten because of our rebellious nature. Every human being has a sin nature. We have a rebellious nature. And it's a dangerous and deadly nature that resides within this body. We have poison within this body. We have something within us that will kill us more than just killing our physical. It will kill us spiritually. It will cause us to go and spend eternity in hell. That's how serious it is. We all have a rebellious nature. And because of this rebellious nature, there's a sobering retribution. According to Romans 6, 23, it says, The wages of sin is death. When the people of God murmured against God and when they murmured against the messenger of God, God sent a retribution. They were stung by these serpents and many were very sick and they were dying because of it. We too, we too, 
have a sobering retribution to deal with. The wages of sin. Wages, my payment, the payment of my sin, my sin nature, the fact that I'm a sinner, the fact that I'm a sinner. There's a wage to be paid. What is that wage, Brad? What is the consequences? What is the retribution? The wages of sin is death. And it means more than physically dying. It means separation. It means separation from God. It means separation from God forever and ever and ever. That's what the retribution will be. We're here with the sin problem. We're here with the sin nature. And there's a payment to be paid. And the wages of our sin is death. But praise the Lord. He has provided a saving remedy. Praise the Lord that He has looked upon us with mercy. As He looked upon His own people with mercy, He said, here's a way of escape. Here's an opportunity to avoid death. Here's an opportunity to avoid separation. Put a serpent on a pole. The serpent that represented the sting of sin, the serpent that was put on the pole, God put one on a pole. According to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, listen to these words inspired of the Lord, written by John in John chapter 3. Listen to these words in verses 13 and 14. The scripture says, no, excuse me, verse 13, no one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And Jesus said that if I be lifted up, all men can come unto me. Let me tell you what. This example of a serpent being hung on a pole is for our benefit because it represents Jesus Christ who was hung on a cross. This is God's saving remedy. Who in their right mind would ever come up with a plan or devise a plan that would tell us the problem that you have is you have a rebellious nature. You're a sinner. If you die in this condition, you will be separated from God forever and ever and ever. But here's the saving remedy. Here's the way to avoid it. Take this man, this godly man, this perfect man, nail him to a cross, and let him die. And if you will go to that cross and you will look, you will live. Who in their right mind would come up with a plan of that, that nature? But God the Father did. Jesus, just think about it, the people of God were being stung by serpents. This serpent represented sin, the sting of sin, and it was that that they had to look at. They had to look at it on a pole. Do you know that the Bible says that Jesus took our sins upon himself? The very thing that will, that will separate us from God forever and ever is the very thing that we go and look at. We look at this one hanging on the cross and we realize that he has become, he took the, all of our sin, he became the sin offering. The Bible says He became that which we are. He took our sins so that we could become what He is, righteous and holy, that we could be saved. Jesus hung on the cross, and He is God's sure remedy. He is sufficient. He is certain. He is able to save us. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in Him. We must go to that cross. We must go and look at that one who has, has been nailed to that cross. And when we look in faith and yield our life to this very one, we can be healed, we can be saved. The poison of sin can be removed. The separation from God can be eradicated. We can be saved and know that when we die, we will spend eternity with God. And the requirements are simple. The requirements are simple. Number one, they're easy. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, believe in your heart, believe with your soul that God is raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Folks, the requirements are easy. They're easy. 
but they're also essential. You must. You must call upon Jesus to save you. You must confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. You must believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You must, you must, you must. It is essential. It is easy. It is easy. Just look and live. Trust in him. Yield your life to him. But it is essential that you must do it personally. That little boy couldn't go to his daddy and say, Daddy, Daddy, I know this will work. I've seen others go and look at the, look at the serpent and they've been healed. They're whole. They're better. They're better. And daddy says, No. Foolish. I'll wait till tomorrow. I'll hold it off. That little boy couldn't say, well, Daddy, I'll go and look for you. He couldn't. He wanted to. He would do it if he could. But he couldn't. He could only look for himself. How many of you are doing the same foolish things today? You have seen the transformation that Christ has made in people's lives that you've known. You have seen people that were rebellious in their nature, bitter in their spirit, empty in their life, hopeless, a void. And you have seen transformations come to people who yielded their life to Jesus. They went to the cross, they looked, and they are living now. And you have that fact. You have that evidence. And you still say, that's foolish. That's a myth. It's fictional. You say, I'll wait till tomorrow when you're dying today when you're taking a chance on dying and going to hell for eternity, you know the truth, you've seen it, and you still wait. Why would you wait? Would you look at a man who knows you can be healed from this poison, you don't have to die, you don't have to leave your family, you don't have to be separated from them, all you have to do, sir, just go take the step of faith and look and you'll be healed, you'll live. How foolish is it? Do you agree with me? Would you say, why would a man wait? Why would a child wait? Why would a friend wait? Why would they not go do that when they hear the news, they hear the shouting, they hear the rejoicing in the community of people that are being delivered and healed and and they're whole now? And you say, why would you wait? But you do. You do. You wait. It's easy. It's essential. And it is for everyone. If you're here today and say, Brother Brad, the reason I waited is because I've done some very stupid, foolish, bad things in life. Let me tell you something. Jesus already knows it because he tasted the very sin that you've committed. He's already tasted it. He's already taken it. He's already felt the pain of it. He's already died for it. Why would you let his death be in vain? He forgives you. He's willing to forgive you no matter what you've done. There's no sin too great that that blood that he shed cannot cover. Nothing. There's nothing. Look at David. David murdered. David committed adultery. David was a liar against the prophet. He, He withheld confession before God. God said, this is a man after my own heart. Why? Because David was a man that was willing to confess, yes, God, yes, I've sinned against you. Yes, I agree with what you say about it. Why can't you come to God? Why can't you come to God and say, God, here I am. I've sinned against you. I've rebelled against you. But I want to be saved. I want to be healed. I'm empty. There's a void that exists in me. I don't want to die and go to hell. I want to spend eternity with you. I want to be with my loved ones who are believers. I don't want to be separated from them forever and ever and ever. And I will not wait another day. I will not wait till tomorrow. I will not let the devil put in my ear an excuse that I'm too bad. You're not too bad to be saved. Because God and His Son Jesus are so great in their mercy and forgiveness. You can be saved. It's for everyone. Today, You can make that choice. You can get up from where you're standing. You can step out from where you're going to be standing. And you can take a step of faith and say, Today, I am giving and yielding my life to Jesus. Today, I'm going to go and I'm going to look at that one who hung on Calvary's cross. And I'm going to look. And in my looking, I'm going to yield. 
And I'm going to say, I believe what you've done, Jesus. I believe, I confess with my mouth that you're Lord. I believe in my heart that you have been raised from the dead. I yield my life to you. I trust in you alone to be my Savior. I am going to completely surrender my life to you alone, Lord. And I'm going to follow you. And when you do, he will receive you. He will receive you to himself. He will forgive you of your sin. He will give you a new nature that will allow you to live for Him. But you must be willing to get on, off of that pew, step out from that pew, and come and say, Today, Brother Brad, I yield my life to Jesus. I'm ready to be saved. Will you not come? If you're here today and say, Brother Brad, I've been saved. And as I watch these young people follow the Lord in baptism, I'm ashamed to admit that I have not been willing to publicly identify that I'm saved. I put it off. I'm going to wait another day. I'm going to do this. Why? Why are you waiting? You're ashamed of Jesus? You're ashamed of him? Why are you ashamed of the one who died for you? Come now. There's no reason to postpone it. The Bible says make disciples and then baptize them. There's no prolonged period of waiting. It says be saved. Follow the Lord in baptism. Then we do the teaching. Then we do the training. Then we help disciple. We don't get saved, and then we disciple for six months, a year, and then, then we'll see if you're good enough to be baptized. We're not good enough to be baptized. We're getting baptized because God is so good and because we're saved. And you need to come and say, today, I need to make my decision public. I'm tired of being a secret disciple. I'm trying to, tired of living in two worlds. I'm, t- I'm ready to draw the line and become a part of that fellowship with the unashamed. And you need to come and be baptized. Some of you may need to come and just pray and say, oh, God... Forgive me that I haven't had a burden to go to my loved ones and say, please go look. Go look at the cross so you can live. I don't want you to die and go to hell. I want you to be saved. I want you as my loved ones, as my family, as my friend. I want you to be saved. And you've kept your mouth shut. And you need to come and say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me of the life that I've been living and the fact that my lips have been sealed. Help me, God, to be a witness. You need to come. Say, there's too much at stake for me to keep being silent. Why don't you come? The Holy Spirit is wanting to draw you to Him. Will you not respond? Will you not come as the Lord would lead? I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We're going to sing a song together, Come Just As You Are. And as we sing this song, this is, this is opportunity time. This is that time.